Hello, everyone. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Sally Harrison. I thanks, Cara. Um, <laughs> I'm, um, I'm a senior lecturer in the School of Creative Arts and I teach on the Broadcasting, Journalism and Media Communications programme and as you can hear I've got some of our students here who are going to be meeting Mario in person later. Um, and well done for still turning up this morning and still making the effort to attend. Uh, Mario especially, thank you for coming across from, uh, from Manchester in the snow and, um, and thanks to you all for coming in and joining in. Um, I just wanted to say a couple of words about uh, well, about Mario, and um, I first met Mario in 2002 when I was working in-house in the BBC in Manchester in a quite a junior position, and Mario was in a department called New Media at, at the time, or it, was, it had New Media in the title. I think the term New Media is so out, outdated nowadays, really, we don't really use that anymore, so that kind of shows how long ago it was, but really it wasn't that long ago. Things have changed so quickly. Over the, over the past 20 years in terms of what's happened um, in, our, in our digital lives um, and in the media that we consume and the way that we consume it. And for your careers going forwards as well, that is, is different, again, from when I started out. There was such a thing as a job for life back in 2002, although I haven't practiced that, you could you could still join a department and see that as a career route forwards, and, and that would be almost the route you were taking. And as far as I could see, I was taking a radio route, and that's what I still do. I'm a radio producer now. I teach here as well. Um, but I bumped into Mario again a couple of years ago at a, at a commissioning round uh, for children's, and my radio career has, has flourished but taken me back into the, into the digital world now as we're embarking on looking at trying to um, get some commissions and make some programs for children's, hopefully the production company that I work for are looking to develop those ideas and students here as well are developing those ideas with me. So even if you feel like today maybe this talk isn't relating to what you want to do in your career, keep an open mind because just maybe it will. You don't know what paths you're going to take and, and maybe you might bump into Mario in 10 or 15 years time and, um, and you know, be looking to, to produce some work or maybe sooner. So um, I hope you enjoy the talk and I hope you can find it interesting from an audience point of view, just as a, a, a watcher of TV or user of online, but also maybe as a, a future producer or creative um, who might be involved in making children's content or digital content for the BBC. Um, so I will welcome Mario Dubois to the stage. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you, Sally. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, I didn't get any whoops, though. Oh, thank you. But maybe at the end, if, if it's, this is, goes well. I um, uh, hope you don't mind me sitting. Um, uh, my legs need... <laughs> Need to rest for a bit. Um, I haven't walked from Manchester. Uh, I've uh, I, I had a probably easier journey than I, I usually have uh, where I live in South Manchester. And I go into Salford uh, on a regular basis. Um, uh, I wanted to just uh, following on uh, Sally's words, um, just tell you uh, some things about um, my career. Uh, I. I probably wouldn't have expected to be where I am today in terms of my career. I didn't take a, a defined path or have a very clear idea about what uh, I was uh, go going to do. Um, it's just evolved over time uh, and it's evolved because the media industry has changed significantly um, and uh, it's taken me down some very interesting and varied and, and broad paths, uh, all of which I've loved uh, and enjoyed massively. Um, I hope that you all have a career um, as rich as I think I have, and probably richer uh, in terms of the sort of experiences that you'll go through. Uh, and I hope that, that uh, I can talk through some of this with you and you can take some stuff away and be I hope in a little bit better informed and maybe uh, inspired to, to take that path. 
Um, so I'm going to crack on. I know I've got a huge amount of time. I've got loads of slides, which I'm going to just whiz through if that's okay. So um, bear with me. And uh, I've left a little, little bit of time for questions at the end. So uh, hopefully you'll be able to ask me anything that I haven't covered. So um, my job title currently is Exec Producer Indies in CBBC Commissioning. Uh, 6 to 16, and I'll explain a little bit more about that as we, we go through. Um, so I'm going to talk about uh, a little bit about my history, not history in general, um, digital, and why that's infused me with some examples of the things that I've done. Uh, a little bit about what I do now, currently in my role, quite a lot around CBBC and the 2020 vision, which uh, they... Uh, announced last year and we're one year through a three-year plan. Um, so on to me. Um, you'll see from the, uh, you see the graphics up there. Uh, these are just some of the shows and content I've worked on in TV. I, I first started off working in television in the arts department. Um, you know, straight out of uni, graduated and, and uh, got a placement working on art shows like Arena. Um, so that was at the time, it was the sort of leading arts magazine program. Uh, I then got uh, an attachment. The BBC's got this curious thing where it lets you um, apply for jobs internally so that you can try out other roles and develop yourself. So I got an attachment to work in Manchester at the time. I was living in London um, to work on a youth program called No Limits, which you probably, most of you won't ever remember, but Jenny Powell, who is still a relatively well-known actress, was one of the hosts there. And it was essentially a, a music magazine show um, that went around the country and had lots of bands playing um, and uh, told you a bit about what was happening in that particular town across the country every week. Um, so it was a rolling magazine show for, on for about 40 weeks of the year. Um, and fortunately, because I came to Manchester, um, I then got a chance to work on Red Dwarfs, the first couple of seasons of that, uh, which is still a bit of a phenomenon in terms of sort of comedy output. Uh, and I enjoyed that massively. It was the sort of first fledgling years of, of that particular brand. Um, and it was still developing. Uh, so uh, I worked with Craig Charles, Chris Barry in terms of the cast, uh, and a guy called Paul Jackson, who's one of the sort of doyens, I suppose, of, of uh, British comedy. He did The Young Ones. Um, uh, Saturday Night Live for ITV, um, a real star. So I sort of hung on to his coattails for a bit uh, and worked with him on lots of his projects. Um, and then I went back to London to do, um, I worked for four years on a uh, sort of groundbreaking art show for BBC Two, which was on 11.15 on uh, five nights a week, Monday through Friday. So I, I used to sort of have a weird routine of, of not actually starting work till about 11 in the, in the uh, morning, but going on to about one in the evening. Um, and it was a live show with lots of uh, arts correspondence stuff, bands in the studio with a famous uh, moment with the Stone Roses where they refused to play, even though they were live on, on air on BBC Two. Um, lots of variety, and, but I learned a lot about how to make live shows and how to work in the arts. Um, and then I went to work on <coughs> The Word, which was a sort of Channel 4 uh, series, uh, youth series, with Terry Christian uh, and Amanda Decadne and lots of other presenters, and that became one of the sort of forefront youth shows for Channel 4 in the early uh, mid-90s. Um, so I've worked both in the BBC and outside of the BBC um, as a freelancer, um, and then uh, came back into the BBC uh, around the mid-90s, um, working on Dragon's Day and Night the Eye Loves. That's where I first met uh, Sally. So that was back in Manchester, running the um, entertainment shows uh, out of uh, BBC Manchester. And we did some stuff around Doctor Who, obviously, um, which I'll go on to next. Um, in about 19... 
99, 2000, um, uh, I made a, um, I asked whether I could run or help run the fledgling new media team in Manchester. There wasn't one at the time. Um, and it was just at the point where the sort of internet was starting to sort of get, get interesting. And, uh, um, and s these are some of the sort of interactive projects that I did over that time. So for Doctor Who, for Doctor Who, uh, we did the first animated Doctor Who series, Scream of the Schalke, uh, with Richard E. Grant as the Doctor. Um, believe it or not, David Tennant played a minor part in it. It was this audio drama that we synced to animation, um, made with um, <coughs> Cosgrove Hall, who are an animation company uh, based in Manchester, and they did lots of children's animations over time. Um, a couple of my other favourites were, uh, we did the Denise uh, Lewis Heptathlon, which was the sort of uh, a click and play sort of little game, um, which was massively successful uh, for BBC Sport. And then uh, a rather curious thing, we did Virtual Replay, which you may or may not have uh, heard or seen, but it was essentially an animated um, tool that allowed you to replay goals from, from the Euro 2004 World Cup. Uh, and then for various other uh, Premier League uh, and Football League sort of shows thereafter. Um, and then I've just added in <coughs> later on in, in the sort of uh, late uh, 2010s, uh, I did the Chelsea Flower Show, but that was a that was a big red button content. So all these are sort of just a sample of the sort of things that I went on to from being essentially a TV um, producer uh, exec to actually start working in digital. Um, and <clears throat> I guess the reason why I, I, I felt digital was such a sort of opportunity was that um, it was a clearer way of connecting with the audience. With TV, you're broadcasting to many, and you don't necessarily have the same sort of contact and connection. You don't have the sort of same level of engagement. Actually, the internet gave you that really direct sort of input and relationship with the audience. And you could really tell what they wanted and how they wanted it. And, um, what sort of content we could provide for them, and how engaged they could be. You know, you, um, the one thing about the internet at the moment, in terms of sort of dig certainly digital content, is you can measure a lot of it. For telly, well, yeah, so around about five million people watched that show on BBC One on, at that night. But actually, I could tell you that for some of our games, I know that um, you know, 100,000 people, kids, come and play our game every day. Um, the bit that they get to most is X amount in the game. The bit they get stuck on is Y, y level. Um, and um, you know they, they engage with us and give us feedback. So it, it's a far more immediate and gratifying, I think, experience in terms of dealing with an audience and providing content for them that's appropriate. Um, so my current role is uh, I'm in the commissioning team um, for CBBC. That's a new role. Um, I've been doing that for probably about in the last three months. Before then, I was looking at both CBBS and CBBC. So um, there's a slightly different age group to the uh, role that I have now. It's between six-year-olds and 16-year-olds, which is very different for children's output. Um, there's a dedicated team for naught to sixes, um, and there's a dedicated team to six to sixteens, um, and we all work for a lady called Cheryl Taylor, who's our head of content. Uh, she's the person that makes all the commissioning decisions for children. So our role is to um, is to provide uh, support to independent producers who want to pitch ideas to children. So they, if they pitch ideas, we can fund those, we can make those um, materialize into real tangible projects. Um, but inevitably, they need to know about the audience, they need to know about the type of output that we want, they need to know what the format of those ideas are, and then they need to know how to deliver them best suitable to the platforms that we manage and control. So my job is to help them 
make the best possible ideas and then get those commissioned so that we can help them deliver them. It's a great job in, in a sense because I can work with the best and the, the brightest producers from around the country and actually some from around the world in terms of getting great kids content. Um, so it's got infinite variety, which is something that I think reflects back on this sort of um, my past history in terms of working on lots of different projects. Um, and it's got the creativity in terms of generating ideas, but it's also got the sort of rigor of, I've actually got to deliver those ideas, I've got to make sure that they are up to standard, that they achieve the sort of editorial requirements that we set, that they are serving the audience in the way we want, um, that they are compliant in terms of child safety and safeguarding trusts, that editorially they're, they're uh, appropriate for our standards. So all the things that you would normally sort of expect an exec producer to do, that's what I do, but I do it for, with, with independent producers and for their output. Um, these are a small sample of some of the things that I think I've, I've been most proud of in the last probably four years that I've worked in children's. Um, I'll, I'll pick out two or three of them because there's, there's um, quite a lot. Um, on the top right, Gory Games was a, um, a Horrible Histories brand. It's a sort of spin-off. Uh, you might have seen it on TV. Um, it's, it's, it's a uh, question and answer sort of panel show for kids. Uh, what we did for that series, it, it, it had been um, commissioned uh, several times before, so this was like series three or four that I was involved in. Uh, and we took the f TV format and made it playable so that you could play simultaneously on your iPad. So whilst you were at home, you could play along with the show. Um, and it used um, some interesting technologies. So it was using audio watermarking. So in a TV show, we put a little watermark. And your device at home, let's say you're on your mobile phone or your tablet, it listens to that trigger, because you and I can't hear it, but it's got a little sort of ping attached to it, and then it triggers an app that generates a question that's the same question that's on the TV show. So you can play simultaneously with the guys on telly, and you can answer those questions, and it's obviously the app is clever enough to say, okay, you've got uh, options A, B, and C, uh, you've chosen B, actually that's correct, well done, tick, and then it'll, it'll continue to score you as you progress in the show. So audio watermarking hasn't been done by anyone, anyone else, and actually this was about three years ago, still hasn't been done. Um, it, it was interesting partly because it was innovation. Um, no one had tried that, especially with a, ch a kid's audience, and there's, there's a sort of positive and negative for that. Kids are much more up for doing that sort of stuff. They're much more digitally savvy. They've got access to different um, uh, devices that they can play on, so that they're, they're well up for it. But also the attention span for kids is, is minute. So once they've got it and they've played it and they've had enough of it, they discard things very quickly. Um, so um, your window of opportunity to sort of hook them into playing some stuff regularly is, is quite small. Um, so Gory Games was something new we tried and was successful in terms of uh, achieving that, but actually we've not really necessarily followed up on that. Uh, Secret Life of Boys is using interactive video. I don't know whether any of you have seen that. You've probably <coughs> used it um, and not known what it was. So if you go on to Very or one of those shopping sites and you see something that you really like and you think, uh, right, okay, let's uh, click on that and it gives you a little display of um, the various different colors you can get, that, that lovely jumper in, or the sizes, or this is how much, or this is where you can get it, your, your you know, uh, here's your discount code for, for going to buy. Um, Secret Life of Boys uses interactive video techniques, so it's got a, a story about um, a child that's come over from Australia, she's uh, visiting her cousins, um, and the, the sort of story plays out in terms of her experiences over a summer. Whilst you're watching that video on your tablet or mobile device and on your um, uh, desktop device, um, <clears throat> you can click on uh, one of the characters, it will give you 
backstory, it will give you an insight into what they're thinking, it will give you a little clue about what they're trying to do and solve stuff, and then it takes you back into the narrative. So you're in control of the story a little bit more than us just publishing stuff. Um, and what's interesting about that technique is that it encourages engagement. Um, the amount of time that uh, the audience watch interactive videos for is far longer than they would watch normal video because there's something to do. You can click on something, you can find something else. Um, and that means that you can get deeper engagement, especially if you're connected with a story or a character. You can find out a bit more about that, find out their backstory. Um, and it helps um, retention of that audience. So because, because they're so engaged, they come back time and time again to watch more of the same. Um, Dixie, the, the other brand at the top, um, is a, a drama, um, and that's um, more of a social drama, um, where it was real-time uh, engagement with an audience, which means that um, we shot a story, um, rather, an indie had shot a story around um, a character. The character was trying to solve a mystery. Um, we were able to pause the story and let the audience have their um, input into the story. What do you think was happening? Um, what do you think, the, how do you unravel the mystery? Post that back into the story narrative on our video platform and then go back to the, the main storyline. So the audience was starting to get much more involved in the story itself and speculating about what was going on. And as a result, it created a lot more comments around that particular story and, and the characters. So again, it's, that was about deeper engagement with the audience. They were really involved in the story. And again, I don't think anyone else has done anything like that um, in terms of even, even uh, adult drama. Um, but for, for kids, it was helping them you know, become much more involved, I think, in terms of the sort of storyline and the characters. Um, I'll just say one more, more thing. I mean, there's lots of other games on there that we've done. Um, but uh, we're currently doing Steve Batchel Climbs the Ogre, which is um, an event. So Steve Batchel's um, uh, an adventurer, I would call him. I don't know if many of you have sort of seen or heard of him. Um, but he's currently up the north face of the Eiger, uh, and he's attempting to climb that. Uh, so we're doing that as a sort of digital first release, currently at CBBC. You can see all of Steve's little videos that he's posting back daily, live, some of them. Some of them are pre-recorded on our social channels. So it's on Instagram's, uh, CBBC's Instagram account. Um, you can get it on the CBBC site. Um, it's it's um, small snippets of short form content telling that story and allowing the audience to follow that story from start to finish um, and it's the first time we've really sort of uh, explored doing something such as, as ambitious that it's obviously it's massively risky because it's absolutely the dangerous thing you could ever possibly do he's well, well trained you know we've, we've gone through all the sort of rigors of, of what, what you need to do to protect him but it's fantastic viewing and it's very engaging in terms of getting the audience involved in something that's so exciting um, so, um, I've mentioned a little bit about the platforms that we use. Obviously, we've got this, the website, which is the CBBC website, um, and most of that is brand support. Um, we're more, we're increasingly uh, producing more apps. So at the moment, um, we've got four or five game apps out um, around our big brands, but we're about to release um, another app which is much more generic which I'll talk about in a minute but um, because kids are much more so in the app space you're more likely to use that on your whichever device you have it poses another problem for us I think because uh, because the uh, burn rate in terms of apps is, is massively quick you know kids are probably going through an app every five days if that 
if, you know, it's, it's probably much, much quicker than that, especially if, if um, they don't, they're not into the app that, that currently uh, they're using. Um, and there's issues around storage on your device and you know, what you keep and what you discard. So it's a massively competitive arena. Obviously, you've got thousands and thousands of apps being released every week, so the competition is hot. Um, and I guess we're just trying to evolve our strategy around what works best and the frequency of, of release of content and how we can um, hook kids into um, using our apps on a more regular basis. Um, massively expensive to produce as well. You know, our, our, our apps are probably costing anywhere in the region of 100 grand each, which is a lot of money. Um, and then when you consider that the burn rate is very quick and your risk profile of our kids going to use that app is very, it's very risky. You could be spending a lot of money on something that does, has relatively small usage and low return. So, um, but we know that we have to be in that market in order to compete with other brands and, and raise our profile in terms of, of kids' um, content. Um, Games, I've mentioned, that's, that's uh, prolific in terms of the uses. That's the most popular thing on our website, games. Um, stories and narrative, kids love uh, our dramas and stories, um, and they're very engaged. Most of those are video. Um, there are one or two audio ones, but not that many. Um, we've started to do some work around podcasts um, and released a couple of those, which I've, I'll, I can mention later. Uh, YouTube, um, I mean, all the social media platforms are quite tricky for us because, in theory, they should be for 13 plus audiences. That's the, that's the regulatory sort of requirement. In reality, we know, you know, lots and lots of kids under 12 are using those platforms. But that's the, and that's the dilemma for us. You know, whilst we know the audience is there. <laughs> Actually, they shouldn't be, unless they've got some sort of parental account that they're accessing. Um, but how do we sort of reach that audience with the right content with, and make sure it's appropriate for them? So that's the, that's the current landscape of how we're trying to sort of deal with um, dealing with social media platforms. You know, we've got um, uh, social accounts on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. They're aimed more at adults, but they cover the content that we make. We know kids are using our accounts, um, but we haven't quite solved making appropriate content for that, age, that 13 plus age group. Which is why um, my uh, role has spread from being six to 12 to now being uh, six to 16. Because we're starting to look at specific content that will work for 13 to 16-year-olds, and how do we commission that? And it's a real opportunity because we, we, we haven't commissioned anything uh, for that yet, um, but we set aside some money in order to do that over the, the, the next few years. Um, digital exclusive, they're, they're things that you know don't support TV shows. A lot of our content supports a TV content and TV commission. Um, but we're looking to create more content that is exclusively for digital and appropriate for those platforms. iPlayer, as you all know, is a massive sort of uh, driver for, for consuming video content. Um, I can't remember the, the statistics around number of views um, this week, but, but I think there was something like 102 million views on iPlayer this week. Um, not just for kids app, but, but just broadly for all of, of iPlayer content. So a lot, lot of people watching a lot of content um, simultaneously. Um, and we're starting to put more stuff onto iPlayer exclusively, so we're trying to box set some stuff that, that sits on iPlayer in the way that Netflix do, um, and seeing whether that has um, the ability to attract an audience and, and get more people to CBBC and CBBC's content. And again, as I've mentioned, um, we're looking at targeting the six, 13 to 16 age group with some specific ideas and content that's appropriate for that age group. So it's very much teen territory. Uh, it's about you know that stage where you're sort of growing and evolving and developing. And you've got you've got independence. You 
you know, you, you want to know how to sort of navigate the world a little bit, um, but not necessarily be given advice or, or um, being told what to do. So, um, yeah, freedom of sort of spirit, but, but with the right content. Uh, so I, I missed the slide, which is this one. Oops. So um, within the whole sort of CBBC structure and BBC children's structure, these are the, all the, the, the key uh, people. So we've got, um, in addition to my team that works on independent produ productions, we've got a team that is headed by Helen Buller who works on in-house productions. And there's probably about two, 300 of them that work on programs that are made for in-house. Um, so they, they uh, generate their own ideas and they make those shows and content and some of it is digital. Uh, and they deliver it, and that's owned by the BBC. Indies, they have a slightly different approach. An independent producer will come up with an idea. They will own that um, IP, the intellectual property on that idea. They will license it to the BBC for us to use. And after, usually it's five years, the license goes back to the producer and they can do whatever they want with it. Uh, unless the BBC says we'd like to renew that license. So there's, there's a sort of difference between independent productions and how in-house productions work. Uh, but those are the sort of key uh, people. Helen Bull is probably the person that I would say you guys should keep in the back of your mind. She's the person that's sort of, if you want to work in-house at the BBC, she runs that team to, to keep her well in the back of your mind. Um, and also Alice Webb, who's the sort of director for children, she's the sort of big boss. Um, if you're going to follow anyone in terms of uh, Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn accounts, uh, I would follow her because she'll, she'll be um, releasing content about where we're going in terms of strategic development for kids' output. So um, make sure that you um, link into her and also... Uh, follow her uh, tweets. That me most of them come from the press office, but but um, she does. She's quite prolific in terms of sort of like tweeting herself and, and um, publishing stuff herself. Um, so I'm going to speed through now. So this year's uh, we've we've had 34 million pounds worth of extra funding, uh, specifically to to do our 2020 strategy, which is about expanding the the age group and delivering new content to kids on the platforms that they are specifically on, not necessarily the platforms that the BBC owns and, and is responsible for. Uh, we know that um, more kids are get, being online than ever before. Uh, you can see those different age groups, and if you go even further up, that's probably a, a bigger stat between uh, 12 and 16. Um, but th there's an increase in terms of the time that's spent in, in terms of online usage, not necessarily at, you know, with us at, at CBBC. We would like more of that share of that content and time spent. Um, and I guess that's what the 2020 structure and uh, strategy is, is there to try and do. It's, it's there to um, create great content and deliver it on the platforms that, where kids are. Uh, and enable them to share that content so um, we're able to harvest as many of those, uh, that audience as we can. Um, some key moments from this year for, for us, for CBBC, uh, in terms of projects, um, we're going to roll out our first voice activated project this year, uh, which is using Alexa. Uh, it's probably going to be a more CBB story time approach. So you can ask Alexa to, to have Tom Hardy read you uh, X story or Y story. And we've got a lot of those assets already, but it's sort of putting it into the X Alexa engine and, and making sure that that's safe. Um, we've got a new festival, performance festival in Liverpool in August. Um, Blue Peter's 60th birthday. Not so much for me, but but I'm sure it's sure it'll be fun. Um, What's working for the 6 to 12s? Well, comedy is working, uh, drama is working, dumping around big comedy, um, a big uh, drama show for in house. Um, Secret Life of Boys, I've mentioned already, that's the interactive video thing. Jamie Johnson is our sort of football 
drama um, aimed at uh, boys and girls, actually. It's not just uh, about uh, boy-oriented content. And then um, I guess the more public service output, uh, so Operation Ouch, where you find out about how your body works, or some comedy uh, content, which is sort of um, a panel show, which is Dog Ate My Homework. So those are really knocking it out of the park for us in terms of that age group. Um, and what we're about to launch for 13 to 16, so, and these are in development, uh, is a new drama called Logan High. Um, comes out in April, um, made by Scottish Indie. Uh, it's a teen drama. Um, I, I absolutely love it. I think it's just very different. It's not, it's, it's real. It's not, um, it's not middle class. It's sort of a bit gritty. Um, but and it deals with all the subjects and themes that the uh, teens um, go through uh, in a, a very very natural way. Um, the dumping ground is is a sort of taking up the uh, stories of past dumping ground characters and seeing where they are now. And we're doing some specials with the uh, Van Tuchelen twins, who are the presenters for Operation Ouch. Uh, one about sex and one about um, again about your body and how that's evolving. Um, how you how you connect with us in terms of ideas? Uh, the BBC commissioning site have a look at that. Um, it's got lots of information about not just CBBC but all the different departments at the BBC, uh, what they're looking for, um, examples who of what type of content works, who to speak to about it. You normally have to subscribe to it as an independent producer. Um, it's a sort of uh, yeah subscription model. You just sign up for it, but you have to get someone to sponsor you so that you know that um, you're a rep reputable company. Um, and um, there's some valuable content on there in terms of what we're looking for to get commissioned. So, for instance, we've just announced what we want for our genres um, across all of children. So in drama, we're looking for a drama that's... Um, for the 13 to 16 age group, um, it's probably going to be high volume and relatively low cost. Um, in some instances, we've got a little bit more detail about the type of content that we'd want. So, for instance, in comedy entertainment, we're looking at uh, for the 6 to 9 age group, something that's low cost but got physical shenanigans. I'm not sure whether I could define what physical shenanigans is, but. Um, the show that, that sort of is a bit like that at the moment is um, a CBB show called Swashbuckle. It's sort of hijinks type type show, um, but it's a sort of more game show uh, approach. So this is sitcom, but um, it gives you a bit more of a clue about what we would like to commission. Um, same for, for Factual. Um, and we also have acquisitions, so they're, they're slightly different. Um, there where we buy a series and um, we're not actually necessarily fully funding that series. We might be a part investor in that output. So, for instance, um, Dennis and Asher currently is an acquisition uh, and we make that with Bino, um, but they have a third party investor as well and I think Netflix are involved in that. So it's co-produced. But we have some editorial control, but we don't invest more than 24% of the budget into that project. So we've got a smaller stake and therefore a slightly smaller voice, but we're probably the biggest stakeholder in that, in that particular commission. Um, uh, and <clears throat> much like um, uh, independent pr productions commissioning, um, those rights re revert back to the independent uh, after a set amount of time, um, but in this instance, we're investing less money in it. Uh, I'm not going to go on to short form. So, um, commissioning, um, we've just gone through our current round of commissions. Some of those uh, uh, genre specifics that I've just mentioned were on the commissioning site. So, Indies formulated their ideas based on what we want, wanted, those ideas, and then they pitched ideas through. And I think we, currently we've got something like 250 ideas being considered. There were probably 
close to 500 ideas submitted. That's a lot of ideas and a lot of time um, for what you can see is, a, is quite a small number of potential commissions themselves. So um, it's, it's highly competitive and uh, complex in terms of sort of getting it right, which is, I guess, why they have people like me doing some of the work I do in order to help indies refine those pictures so that they stand a better chance of winning some business. Um, uh, I'm going to scoot over this as well, which is just saying that we're using lots of data in order to measure our requirements. So, you know, how are our platforms performing against other platforms? So is it better to go on iPlayer? Is it better to sort of think about uh, going off platform for teenagers uh, because they're not at the BBC, they're not using our platforms, actually they're on Insta or, or Snapchat or whatever the next sort of big social media platform would be. Is it, would it be, be better for us to think about um, TV, radio, um, is it apps, how are they performing, um, video on demand? Um, how do we compare all our, our, our different properties? Because obviously they're all competing for your attention simultaneously. It's not just children's. It's like you might actually think, well, actually BBC Three is the right place for me. Or you might think, well, actually, I'm only going to consume iPlayer stuff. Or you might be a parent and think, well, actually, Playtime Island's the thing for me because I can sit my child in front of that and, and that's two hours gone and they're really entertained and they're learning from that experience. So um, it's an, we have to consider all those things in order to find out what's our, um, what are our requirements in terms of where we're saying we want some factual output, is that on X or Y platform, and how long does that, that experience last for before we have to renew it and find something else that's gonna engage the audience. Um, and we're also looking at you know, our competitors and how they're performing as well. Um, with that in mind, we're also thinking about how we sort of update our digital products, so um, the, the app that we're about to release is a Buzz app, which uh, I, t I hope this is going to play, but it's, um, it's a topical daily, it's, supposed, it's aimed at daily content um, that will make you laugh or um, that you can share. Uh, so let me just see whether that's going to play. No. Okay, well, no sound on that, but... Um, a little bit of sound. When's the last time you had a poo? Five months ago. Is it? Yeah. Five months without anything going in or out of pretzel. You know, at this stage, I, I can't rule out the worst. So you can see that they, it, it sort of follows... Uh, Okay, so <laughs> well, you can see that, um, that the approach that they've taken is to, to look at all the sort of social media sort of techniques that, that are around and see whether we can create some content out of the thousands of hours of material that we have made already or making for uh, CBBC as a channel and then republish that as an app so that you can refresh that on a daily basis. <clears throat> so um, it launches at the end of this month. Um, it's called Buzz currently, uh, although there's lots of other things called buzz, um, and we hope it will uh, mean that it's a stepping stone in terms of getting CBBC into that app market and getting the audience uh, to think about coming to us for more content of that type, but um, it's an experimental uh, approach, so we'll see how that goes over time. Um, we're going to go big on more games, so if you've got a passion for game ideas, yeah, I'd love to hear those. Um, uh, we've got three games <laughs> um, scheduled for release in the next couple of months. Um, there should be more, and um, they should be more frequent. Um, uh, we're also repurposing some games. So this is a Peter Rabbit game, which is a sort of um, a left to right sort of slider game. Um, and we've made uh, a new Go Jetters game out of the same engine, 
Um, we're doing some more stuff around updating Newsround, which is our biggest sort of one of our biggest sites online, um, in order to get kids much more aware of the sort of current news uh, content. And then, as I mentioned, we're exploring some new technology. So, the voice uh, activated content uh, will be out probably later on this summer with some CBB stuff. We're looking at sort of geotagged content, uh, AR. Um, we've had quite a lot of AR ideas. Uh, we're not at the point where we're considering VR ideas yet, except that they may be suitable for the, the 13 to 16 audience. Um, and there's more stuff around personalization. Uh, and we're obviously looking at how we sort of explore our Instagram and other social media accounts as well. So, uh, that's all about voice. Uh, my last slide is, um, is a career in digital or straight BBC right for me? Um, by me, I meant you, I guess. Uh, it, it's been brilliant for me. I've, I've had a massive amount of variety. I've really enjoyed what I've done. Um, I've been really lucky. Um, as I said before at the start, I, haven't, I, I didn't have a set plan. I fell into a lot of stuff. And I think that's a sort of not a bad thing to, to think about. Um, think about what your passion and interests are um, so that you can um, explore those best. You know, if you're into gaming or if you're into story narrative, where can you best find a route for you to work in that environment and explore that? Um, digital, I think, does that. I think it, it, it gives you the, all the right tools. Some of that stuff you can create yourself. You don't have to have a production team around you. You can make some of that yourself. I'm getting some really interesting ideas from individuals who've got this sort of concept, but they don't know how to sort of evolve and develop that. So. It works for a broadcaster, but that's not necessarily, you know, the the right route for them. They may their idea might be really suitable for a business or uh, another area of um, industry or a product. Um, so it's just thinking about your interests and, and trying to explore that and um, build on that. Uh, and when you do find the right thing, it's just how do you sort of make sure that you uh, are you're able to fully capitalize on that you know I always think about um, when I'm applying for, for jobs or uh, if I'm applying for jobs you know I want to find out about you know is that is the thing that I'm applying for something that's going to stimulate me and make me get out of bed every day and really want to go to work yeah absolutely if I could achieve that that would be really and I, and I think I have for most of my career um, is the company the right company for me you know, do they give me, uh, they treat me right, fairly, equitably, reward me? Uh, are they going to help me develop as an individual? Um, are they going to respect me in terms of being able to take my ideas and help me develop those ideas? Um, uh, I think the BBC offers you a lot of that. I think it's, it's still got that um, openness where you can move around a lot and you can develop your own skills. You know, you can work in digital, TV, radio, um, you know, any of the other sort of um, skills that you might want to try and explore. It's massively competitive. There are lots of different schemes that you can apply for, graduate schemes, disability schemes, um, just jobs uh, at entry level. Um, they're massively competitive. You know, the, the, the graduate schemes probably get about 10,000 applicants for 24 jobs um, uh, so you have to be absolutely at the top of your game in order to sort of get those roles but if you're prepared you know you've done your research and you know you're passionate about stuff I, I think those count for a lot in terms of, of um, appealing to employers like the BBC um, and the digital sort of world hasn't it doesn't stop there. You know, there are so many small companies that, that need that sort of expertise and support. And, you know, you're at the forefront um, of doing that. You know, you're using all the devices. You're, you're using apps. You're, you're thinking about how you use that in terms of what you want to get out of it. 
that's what companies are after. Um, so I would encourage you to, to build on your skills, find the right vehicle for that company to work with, and um, just devote some attention to how you can work with that company. Um, research them, find out who, who runs the company, find out about their products, um, come with ideas, um, you know, make it impossible for them not to employ you. Uh, and I think that um, with that approach and attitude, I think you, know, you stand a really good chance of, of, one, getting a fair hearing and getting your foot in the door. And sometimes that's all that it's about. Get your foot in the door, get yourself known. Maybe you might not get the, the first job you apply for with that company. But if you persevere, if you, you know, continue to say, OK, I want to work for you, uh, you might not have a job now, but you might have one in a year's time, and I'm going to make sure I have all the, the prerequisites in terms of being able to achieve that. And here's my experience. Here's how I've grown and developed my skills that's appropriate to you. I think that pays real dividends. Questions? <laughs> Any questions? Do you mind shouting? <laughs> 